Okay. Check the waiting room one more time here. Let's go. Let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, we, I am Lee Pike. I am uh, one of the co-founders of the Handsome Ladies, the Raleigh chapter. Um, I co-founded the chapter with my mom, Vicki Posey, in uh, 2018. So we're going on our third year. Um, the Handsome Ladies uh, National Organization was founded in 2012 with a goal of um, encouraging women in the bluegrass community through education, through monthly jams, um, and just and, and just encouragement and community. So uh, there are chapters in San Francisco, Boston, Portland, uh, Chicago, Nashville, and Seattle, and then also Raleigh. Um, and so we're just happy to be a part of the Handsome Ladies community. I'm going to put the um, the website in the chat if anybody wants to check out the Handsome Ladies to know more. Um, and I will also put my email in the chat. So if you are interested in joining us for right now, Zoom jams or these panels or other fun virtual things. And then when we can finally get back together in person, we have monthly um, all ladies jams. And then occasionally we'll invite the fellas to join us. Um, so if you're interested in that, feel free to shoot me an email. And we're just really excited to have everybody. And thank you so much to Jamie and Pinecone for um, partnering with us on this. I'm going to hand it off to Jamie Katzcourt, who is going to be the moderator for our awesome panel. So thanks, everybody, for being here and Jamie and all the panelists. And my mom, of course, co-founder. Couldn't do without you, mom. <laughs> Thank you, Lee, for the introduction and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Katzcourt. I am the Communications and Programs Manager for Pinecone, which is the Piedmont Council of Traditional Music. We are based in Raleigh, North Carolina. I know we have folks joining us tonight from all across the country. So thank you so much to everybody for taking time out tonight to be here with us. In a moment, I'll turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves. But for those who are not familiar with Pinecone, uh, before COVID, we were a presenting organization doing year-round concerts and jam sessions and youth programs uh, all around bluegrass and roots music. Um, once the pandemic hit, like everyone, we closed down all of our in-person events. We've been doing online workshops every week on Wednesdays in all different instruments, in songwriting, all different topics uh, related to roots music. Um, we also were involved with some other local organizations in running an artist relief fund to help provide funds and assistance to artists who were out of work due to the pandemic. Um, we also, of course, are the local organizing partner for the International Bluegrass Music Association for the Bluegrass Festival here in downtown Raleigh every year, which was virtual this past year. Um, and we're looking forward to continuing to work with them. And we're just very grateful to Vicki and Lee for having this idea and for inviting Pinecone to be part of it. So thanks again to everyone for taking the time to be here tonight. I'll put Pinecone's website in the chat as well. And uh, we do ask just a little housekeeping. Um, please stay on mute unless you have a question to ask toward the end, um, because we do want to avoid the echo and make sure that everybody can hear each other and be heard. Um, but if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Let us know where you're here from too, if you want to share that. Um, the chat can be kind of the ongoing side conversation as well. So we're glad you're all here and we're excited for a great night. And I'm going to go, Nancy, do you want to kick us off? Hi, everybody. I'm Nancy Cardwell. I'm uh, talking to you from Burlington, North Carolina. And I uh, am the executive director of the IBMA Foundation, formerly known as the Foundation for Bluegrass Music that has been around since around 2008. And we are a charitable organization that supports the future of bluegrass music uh, through philanthropy and plan giving. And we're involved in uh, scholarships and grants and, and things like that. Go to our website at bluegrassfoundation.org if you're not familiar with it, please. I grew up playing uh, bluegrass music. I probably heard it before I was born. I was on stage with my dad's band in Branson and on his little ro live radio show when I was seven years old and I'm in my early sixties now. And um, 
I've written about music since I was in college. Uh, first started writing for Bluegrass Unlimited when around 80 or 81. Um, grew up in a family bluegrass band in the Missouri Ozarks. I've worked as a, a Spanish teacher. I've been a professional Girl Scout, a journalist, professional Christmas caroler. Um, probably the coolest recent gig I've had is I got to be the bass player with Jesse McReynolds and his Virginia boys and play the Opry about every weekend in 2017, big fun. And um, the most recent thing I've recorded, uh, other than song demos, is probably a Christmas album that I did with my daughter, Erin, who's 34, and it was a hammer dulcimer flute uh, instrumental album. But anyway, it's nice to meet you guys, and I look forward to learning all about you. And um, I forgot to mention, I worked for IBMA for a little over 20 years, and I uh, was the executive director the last couple of years I was there. And uh, so I'm a bluegrass person like you are. Nice to meet you. Patty, how about you? Hey, everybody. I am Patty Hopkins Kinlaw. I'm here in Winterville, North Carolina, in the eastern part of North Carolina. Um, I am a performer and educator. Um, I have a private studio here in the Greenville area in my hometown of Williamson, North Carolina, where I teach Suzuki violin as well as um, bluegrass fiddle. So we do a little bit of both. I'm a hybrid player, I like to say. Um, I come from a family of a, my mother plays organ. Uh, she's a church organist and my father is a country boy. So I like to say I'm a little bit of a hybrid. When I met my husband in early college, he comes from a traditional bluegrass family. And I'd already kind of been on the fiddle route as a teenager. So it just fell right into place for me. And I guess I've been, I'm going on my 16th year teaching, uh, private studio and also in the performance aspect as well. I currently play in a band called Hank Patty and the Current out of Raleigh NC. Um, I played with Miss Linda Dawson. We had a du female duo, Linda and Patty, as well as played in Kick and Grass together. I'm, I'm looking forward to some stories this evening from everybody. And that's a little bit about me. I have a, a one-year-old boy that's going to turn, well, he's going to turn one in five days. So I'm kind of a new mom in 2020 as well. Thanks, Patty. Leslie Brown. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> hey, y'all. How's everybody doing? Uh, I'm Leslie Brown, and I'm here. Um, I um, am in Burlington, North Carolina, not too far from Miss Nancy. And um, I uh, play in the band Dewey and Leslie Brown, the Carolina Gentleman, with my husband, Dewey Brown, um, who played for Dr. Ralph Stanley for many years. Um, I grew up in bluegrass. I'm from the Appalachian Mountains, a little town called Grundy, Virginia, and I'm an authentic coal miner's daughter. Uh, my daddy um, was in coal mines all his life, and um, he also played in a family band, so um, bluegrass was just in my blood, in my bones, and um, then I started clogging, so I would go around to the festival circuit and clog, but did not play music until I met Dewey and um, he uh, played for Ralph and then Ralph passed away. And uh, he said, um, I told him, I said, you're not leaving me at home again. Cause you know, he was on the road with Ralph and I was at home raising the kids. We have two beautiful children, um, age 10 and seven, about to be eight and 11. And uh, he said, well, you better learn how to play an instrument. And so I picked up the bass and I said, okay, I'm going to. And uh, so that's kind of how it all started. But um, we have a lot of fun. We also own um, the Liberty Showcase Theater in Liberty, North Carolina. If there are any folks out there, um, check us out, thelibertyshowcase.com. We've been closed for a while due to COVID, but we're looking forward to starting back up soon. We have a lot of great acts there. Um, we've got Tracy Lawrence coming, the Oak Ridge Boys, Jimmy Fortune, the list goes on. We have a lot of fun there. We also uh, bought a new theater in Reedsville, North Carolina. That'll be coming soon. I'm also a nurse. That's what I did uh, previous to all of these other things. And um, anyway, I just love to have fun and I'm so excited to be here and um, be sure and look us up doing lesliebrown.com. We've got a single out, Dana, um, upcoming music coming out and um, real excited to be here. And thank you guys for joining us. Awesome. Thank you, Leslie. Linda Dawson. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm Linda Dawson, and I'm right here in Raleigh, North Carolina. 
Um, I was so fortunate to find the handsome ladies when they started and start jamming with them um, and found an incredible group of supportive women who were really open to giving people space to try new things, which was great because I played for years with the Kick and Grass Band. I'm a songwriter, I'm a singer, but I didn't pick up the guitar till I was in my 20s. And it's been so much fun getting to jam with the handsome ladies and try my my hand at flat picking, which is not anything I ever did when I played in Kick and Grass. Um, that's been really fun to kind of just try new things and jam with y'all. Um, I, I love to write songs. I've, I've written with Becky Buller and um, some other artists and that's really something that speaks to my soul. Um, and have had a lot of fun stories playing with Patty and Linda and Patty traveling around with kicking grass and um, I like her. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing some stories tonight, so. And last and certainly not least, Jessie Lang. Um, hi, I'm Jessie. Um, I'm originally from Raleigh, North Carolina, but right now I'm in Nashville. Um, I'm a singer, songwriter, and guitarist. Um, I grew up going to the Pinecone Jams and the summer camps and programs. Um, I started playing guitar when I was nine and growing up, my parents took me to a lot of festivals and concerts for bluegrass, so I was always around it. Um, I have played with the Lang sisters and with the Carolina Pinecones throughout middle and high school. And now I'm studying music at Belmont University. And I'm just so happy to be here and to be a part of this panel with some of my earliest mentors. Great, so thank you all so much for being here. We'll start with actually one of the easier questions of the night and this one was actually submitted. So thank you for that. Um, who were some of your influences as you were getting into music? Female, male, any of the above? Just a couple folks who influence your music or your approach to music or the work that you do. I'll jump in and start and say that I didn't really um, get influenced by bluegrass until I was in my 20s. So before that, I was really um, influenced by some more of the, the female folk genre um, and the, the whole Lilith Fair scene that was coming out in, in the 80s and 90s and the Indigo Girls, um, Sarah McLachlan, Ani DeFranco, people like that before I found bluegrass. And then once I discovered bluegrass music, I was so inspired by people like Alison Krauss, who opened so many doors for women, um, and Claire Lynch, um, Valerie Smith, um, people who kind of were setting the tone for um, the music in the time that I was starting to play it. So those are some of the people that I count as my influences. Leslie, you look ready to jump in. You unmuted yourself. <laughs> well, I went ahead because I'm on a tablet, so I don't know if everybody wants to see my finger, but um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, say mine. Mine are not as traditional. Um, I mean, some of them are, but um, I would have to say that I've got influence from all different genres of music as well. Um, Michael Jackson, Beyonce. <laughs> I mean, really, I listen to so much, um, so many things, but Bluegrass is, uh, you know, where my roots are, and obviously Dr. Ralph Stanley, Patti Loveless, um, Valerie Smith, um, there, the list goes on, but I listen to a little bit of everything and um, listen to it loudly, and um, so <laughs> it's uh, all the way from rap, R&B, to Bluegrass, which people find that so funny, but that's where all of my influence comes in. <laughs> Love it. Nancy. Um, in the 60s, my sister and I, my younger sister and I would watch the Stoneman family on TV. And we just thought that was so cool because Ronnie and, and uh, Donna Stoneman could really play their lead instruments well. And, uh, you know, hung right in there with their brothers and their dad. And they were um, early role models in bluegrass. I, I learned from my dad, uh, I was telling the ladies before we started that he collected instruments and pretty much taught himself how to play everything. So I, it was like growing up in a candy store, you know, it was just um, 
hanging on the trees. It was always around me. I probably heard bluegrass before I was born. Um, Hazel Dickens, uh, you know, inspired me and influenced me. Um, Emmy Lou Harris, you know, I was a, a high school a student in the 70s. I like the whites. Uh, if I ever have to sing karaoke, I usually do a Karen Carpenter song. I always loved her voice. Um, on the um, the business side, I'd say Beth Paul, who used to run Sugar Hill Records, and Mary Daub, who runs the Gray Fox Bluegrass Festival, are two of my female mentors um, on the business side. But um, And, you know, living in Missouri, uh, we were kind of off the beaten path. A lot of bands didn't tour out there. Bill Monroe came a lot. Jim and Jesse did. Country Gazette did. I think I saw the Osbournes once. That was it. We we pretty much just stayed at home and played our own music. And I, and I grew up singing gospel and old time music as well as bluegrass. So it's enough for me. <laughs> Patty or Jesse, you gonna toss a coin for it? Go for it, Patty. I'm just all all these memories are flowing back. There's been so many experiences when you're a musician. There's just so many things that happen and so many different places you travel and people you meet. Um, I mean, growing up, like I said, I was in church and I sang in church in the choir, played violin. And, and so a lot of that music, you know, church music is in my brain as well as Bach and Beethoven, things like that, because I grew up classically. I remember watching Hee Haw when I was little. Like I have very good memories of Hee Haw episodes and... As I got a little bit older, learning, you know, the fiddle hits, even through some of my violin studios, like Orange Blossom Special and Turkey in the Straw, which I totally fell in love with that style of music, where I fell in love with that style of music. Then I found out my great-grandfather um, had a radio show. He played on a radio show in Bertie County in the 50s, so I, he played a lot of different instruments. He's on my wall back here, and I acquired his fiddle, which has machine head pegs on, and I use it for my old-time fiddle. So I knew it was in the roots. Um, once I got, like Linda said, Allison Krauss. I mean, I had the Allison Krauss and Union Station new favorite album. I mean, I wore that thing out. And then when I got to college, I started much more experimental violin kind of music. I mean, I'm a very big Jean-Luc Ponty fan. So you got that jazz, crazy jazz fusion influence in me. And I saw Mark O'Connor play for the first time my freshman year in college. And he was touring with the American Seasons, which is a spinoff of kind of the Vivaldi Four Seasons. So they played Vivaldi and then the American Four Seasons. And he played his Amazing Grace as an encore. And I remember sitting in the audience that night as a, a violent performance manager thinking, Pe people can do this? Like you can merge these two genres? So there's a lot of my influences there. And like I said, when I met my husband, you know, my first Bluegrass Festival was... Um, my first bluegrass festival was Pretty Fest outside of Raleigh in 2002. And that was a really awesome experience for me. And from then on, I fell in love with some really great bluegrass fiddle players. I wore that Bobby Hicks Texas Crap Shooter album out. Love that album. I wanted to play breakdowns like Kenny Baker. I mean, and so that's kind of where I went perform performance wise. But I have a lot of educator mentors as well and influences. Cool. Jesse. Um, yeah, so I feel like growing up now in the 2000s, I have a pretty wide range of influences. I grew up listening to a lot of Alison Krauss and Doc Watson. Doc Watson together with early Taylor Swift inspired me to pick up the guitar. Um, but over the years, I really also love Sierra Hall. Um, I play a little bit of mandolin as well. And so she was a big influence. Um, Sarah DeRose as well. Um, Brian Sutton as well for more of the guitar. But I think lately I've been getting into more of the progressive, new grass folk kind of genres. I've been listening to a lot of the Lonely Heartstring Band, um, Christy Lene, and Joni Mitchell. So really a lot of my influences are acoustic, but I think that they've all had a lot of impact on the style that I play. Yeah, and I think that leads too into the you know, a lot of you have talked about all the different influences. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about how you got into bluegrass in particular. And some of you have already mentioned it. And some of us were talking about it a little before we started. 
but talk about what it was like getting into bluegrass, what it was like growing up. Did you always feel welcome? Were there any times you didn't feel welcome? And what what was that? Was that related to being a woman or was it just kind of skill level wise? And yeah, talk about growing up in bluegrass or how you came to bluegrass if you came to it later. Um, it was terrifying for me. <laughs> and it wasn't because of anybody else. It was me. I wasn't used to playing fiddle music. I remember sitting outside the Wilson Bluegrass Farm in my car to talk myself into going some side and jamming. So that was me as a teenager. I, I was just not used to that genre. But as a woman, for the majority of the time, I felt very welcomed. I mean, I already had a skill set. So I already could play melodies and things like this and, and jump in there. And the thing about the fiddle is that you can have more than one fiddle in a jam. It's not like you're going to have four basses, right? So it was very easy for me to get in. I remember gluing myself next to men in their 60s or 70s to stand beside them to learn as much as I could. Um, and that was from Wilson Bluegrass Barn. And that was from also from uh, Lenore Community College when they had the jams there as well. So, I mean, I was, I was deep in it and I caught the bluegrass bug pretty early on. Once I heard it, I was, I didn't leave. I was there for the remainder of the time. Um, like I said, being a woman was pretty welcoming. I think um, later on, there were some things, I'm sure there's some other questions that can lead to this, but later on, there were some barriers, maybe some barriers that we can talk about. But in the beginning, I felt it was like a, a very welcome environment, even though it was very male dominated. Not as much now, but in the beginning. Yeah, and just a quick follow up, Patty, were there were there other women at those early jams you went to? You said they were male dominated, but were there any other women there? There were, yeah, I mean, there there were a few, but there weren't as many as, as there are now, so. Just the natural evolution of the genre and what we're doing here tonight, so. Nancy, you gonna jump in? Sure. A lot of the women that, that I saw in the early days, you know, were people in family bands. I grew up in a part of the country where there were a lot of family bands. So it was somebody's wife or sister or, or um, that sort of thing. And, and usually playing rhythm instruments, playing the bass or playing rhythm guitar. And so in more recent years, you know, um, there have just more and more, uh, been more and more female talented, incredibly talented lead instrument uh, instrumentalists and band leaders, and you see more uh, side, what do you say, side musicians instead of side men uh, in bands, uh, which you didn't see a lot of before. Um, I, you know, grew up in the middle of it, so I always felt welcome. It was just a part of my life and how I grew up. There, you know, there's some arrogant jerks that you're going to run in, into in any line of work <laughs> or a type of music and, and those can be male, they can be female, you know, and I, I tend to ignore bad behavior unless it becomes too bad and then I'll say something about it. But um, I have a quiet voice when I sing. I guess that's the, the main thing and really loud, high testosterone jam sessions. You know, sometimes I just can't be heard because I don't sing loud. I can play loud, you know, I can, you can hear my bass, but um I didn't, I, it was a great way to grow up, you know, and, and I've, I've been the only girl in a band so many times that I'm just used to it. And, you know, sometimes I think I get along with men better than I do women just because of that, you know, uh, not that I don't love you all, but, <laughs> but I, it just has seemed normal to me and I've never thought much about it, I guess. Leslie, how about you? Um, well, like I said before, you know, I grew up in it. Um, my dad was like a super fan, <laughs> bluegrass fan, going to bluegrass festivals, um, watching Hee Haw. Um, I mean, gosh, we done something every weekend. Like we never stayed home. We were always going to a festival. And then when I started clogging, then, you know, we were definitely on the road all the time, just going and and mostly festivals that I could clog because some are more geared towards that than others. Um, but yeah, I mean, I grew up in it and, um, you know, have felt welcome um, most of the time. 
um, haven't really, you know, because I, you know, like Nancy was in it. So, you know, I felt welcome. And my husband has been tremendous encouragement for me um, because coming in from being, you know, on the sidelines, as far as a wife, a fan, um, you know, a dancer, and then going from that to being uh, an artist and a songwriter, a singer, a bass player, um, you know, that was a little awkward, but for me, like Patty said, for me, but not really for anybody else. I didn't, I think I was just insecure when we first started uh, Air Band, but as time went on, you know, I, I became super uh, confident and, you know, everybody's having a good time. So it's hard not to, you know, it's, it's just hard not to, it's hard to not feel included unless like Nancy said, there are some people that are just jerks and um, that's men and women, um, <laughs> all colors, all, you know, that, that spans across um, all walks of life. And, um, but as far as, you know, not feeling welcome, I've never really not felt welcome. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Jesse, how about for you? Yeah, um, I feel very lucky to be in this genre, like when I'm in it, like growing up during the time that I have grown up, because I feel like during my life in bluegrass. I've just seen more and more women in bluegrass being recognized and more visible. So I grew up looking up to a lot of um, women in bluegrass. So I never thought it was something that I couldn't do or anything like that. I think that um, through a lot of organizations like Pinecone and Jam, Junior Appalachian Musicians um, that provide more opportunities for for youth of all walks of life to um, learn the music through summer camps and jams and educational programs. I think that was really instrumental in my development. Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that and having people like Patty and Linda to look up to. Um, I think, I mean, there's always the occasional person who would say oh you're pretty good at guitar for a girl but I mean there was never anything big and I definitely feel very um, lucky for these programs and to be in bluegrass when I am. Awesome thank you. Linda. Yeah, I mean, I uh, just to kind of piggyback off a couple things that uh, some of the other panelists have said. Um, I've always felt very welcome in in the bluegrass community, and um, I think what Nancy was saying about in jam sessions or even in a performance that bluegrass is part of part of bluegrass is the high lonesome sound, and it's so hard for women to sing, you know, that's a very particular thing for a male tenor voice to sing. Um, for a female voice, you have to really find your own space and, and, and find your own way to express the same feeling. Um, you know, I think it's harder when you're in a jam to be loud and in that high range as a woman, that's called a soprano and that's not bluegrass. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting thing to think about and, and how you do that. Um, I think women approach that in different ways and um, find their own way to do it. Um, but the other piece of that I think is that as women, a lot of times to what Patty and Leslie were talking about, we, we are insecure in, the, in that women tend to want to know how to do something before they try it as opposed to sort of this male, like, let's just jump in and see what happens. <laughs> and it, it was hard for me to enter into a jam because of my own personal sense of responsibility for being good at it before I did it. But you can't learn how to do it unless you try it and you're not good at it till you try it and you're around people. So like what Jesse was saying about camps and youth opportunities to learn that when you're young, 
in a low pressure situation as opposed to walking into a high professional jam where you feel like you're putting it all on the line and you don't know what you're doing is a totally different scenario. So um, I don't know, I think for, for me, getting the confidence to, to realize that nobody knows what they're doing and they're all just having a good time and it's okay, just jump in and go for it has been, that's been the freeing thing for me. And that's um, something that I think is part of, you know, how we're raised as women to, to have a sort of different self, a level of self critique that we do to ourselves. Um, so just my own two cents on that one. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think that goes into a couple of the other questions that I have kind of queued up here. Um, one being, you know, it's 2021. And here we are still talking about, you know, women in bluegrass and still, you know, every once in a while getting the pretty good for a girl or, you know, some of those other like offhand meant to be compliments, but maybe they're not the compliments people think they are. Um, so, you know, what I guess part one would be what are some of the barriers that still make this conversation feel relevant and important? And then part two would be, you know, what is the role of organizations like the Handsome Ladies or Pinecone or IBMA or any of the organizations who do more of the organizing around this, in addition to, you know, what people can do individually to help kind of alleviate some of those fears or insecurities whether it's offering more youth programs and opportunities to learn, um, learning jams, um, you know, where, why are we here and where do we go next? Big questions, right? But, but the small steps. I mean, I'll just jump back in and say, I think that, um, I, I really appreciate this conversation because we don't often talk about um, the reality of the fact that women and men are different. We actually are different. And so <laughs> whether it's physically different or um, different in the way that we bear and raise children, um, you know, what Leslie was talking about, do we went off on the road while you raised the kids? I mean, somebody has to raise the children. <laughs> And um, it's kind of hard. And Patty, you know, you and I traveled when I was breastfeeding babies and you're in that situation now. I mean, that is a reality that we all have to talk about. Um, how we choose to approach that is a totally different story, but it's only now becoming something as a society that we're comfortable even having conversations about in cross, um, it, with both men and women present even. And so I think that that's something that we have to be aware of um, and that our role, what our traditional cultural roles and expectations are generationally um, are also different. And what my parents and my grandparents thought women and men could or should do is different than what my parents think and what I think and what Jesse's generation thinks. And um, those are just real, whether they should or shouldn't be the case, they are, they are part of the way people perceive the world. And so we have to acknowledge that if we're even gonna shift, shift it. Um, and I think the fact that we are quote unquote still having this conversation is totally normal because it really hasn't been that long since women were even allowed to vote. <laughs> so, you know, like, this is um, just taking the bigger picture approach that I, I am so happy that I feel welcome in this community and, and appreciated for any musical ability I bring to the table regardless of my gender um, and how that would have been 50 years ago is completely different. So we have come a really long way, even though it may feel like we're still having the conversation, I I think um, it takes time to change the perceptions and realities that people come from. Linda, I think about that a lot. You know, when we were on the road together, you know, and you had two babies, um, 
So I think my initial barrier was the fact that of the differences between men and women, I couldn't wait to tour. I want to, all I want to do is tour. So, but when you look for, when somebody's looking for a fiddle player, at least in the beginning when I wasn't doing a lot of singing, you know, I can't just jump on a tour bus full of men. That's just not how it worked. I remember being in a big, uh, a major bluegrass artist home and saying, you know, have you heard of any jobs or anybody looking for fiddle players? You know, and he said, well, it's harder for women because of that fact, like for me jumping on a tour bus with a bunch of men or the fact that you have to get another hotel room or, you know, costs go up, cost effectiveness and things like this. So that didn't really pan out in the beginning. Um, it was after I had moved home when it panned out, uh, my mom got a business card from a friend of hers that had gone to a house concert and it said Harry Dawson, the kid and grass band. <laughs> and I called Harry Dawson and I went to audition for this band called the kid and grass band over on Yates Mill Pond Road in Raleigh. And I was doing some research on the internet and realized that their lead singer was a female and it was Linda Dawson. So there's the beginning for me. I joined kick and grass and, ha and had a woman in the band immediately. Um, even though I have been surrounded by men, it was really nice to have Linda and we branched out on our own Linda did some duo stuff, you know, have traveling with two women versus, you know, five men or four men and a woman. So it really made a difference to have another woman in the band. And that's, I've seen that more and more as the years go along. I mean, Billy, Billy Feather plays guitar and Hank Patty in the current now. So I also have another woman in the band, which is really nice. And so, you know, hearing everyone say that you do, you feel welcome and you feel part of the community, um, knowing even that there are maybe still some barriers or some differences that make entry, whether it's personally or professionally or wherever we're trying to come in from, what do groups like the Handsome Ladies offer that help make that transition easier or that help us continue making the progress to where we want to be? I think the, one of the main things is just encouragement, you know, and I think one thing organizations can do is to look at the, the role models uh, from the last two or three generations, you know, look at Gloria Bell, you know, big salute to Kristen Scott Benson, who was a female sideman, you know, with the Larry Stevenson band and the Graskels, still is with the Graskels, and, uh, you know, just made it work, and a big salute to the, the girlfriends and wives of those band members who didn't freak out because there was a girl on the bus you know because she's just a kick-ass banjo player she deserves to have those jobs you know and um that just wasn't that common before but you know Kristen is a pioneer I'd say in that respect and so I'd say you know recognize uh Lynn Morris Gloria Bell uh Louise Scruggs you know the people the women who were their forerunners and also encourage you know young people like Jesse, you know, uh, who are coming along, uh, that's the main thing we can do is just uh, shine some light on uh, what's been done and encourage the next generation. Yeah, I'll add on that, Nancy, um, what you said. I totally agree with that because I think if I would have had the encouragement at a younger age, I would have done what I'm doing now much younger. But it took my husband being that close and, and his encouragement and to kind of get me started. And then I think it's great. Like what we're doing tonight here on this forum, um, you know, Pinecone, IBMA um, and the Handsome Ladies and lots of other organizations. I'm, I'm really excited to see, you know, that encouragement and just, you know, keep that up because that's like the key. Cause there's a lot of people out there that were probably like, me when I was younger, I'm like, oh, I can do that. There's no way I could do that, <laughs> you know. And all it takes is somebody saying, yes, you can. You can do it exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I just want to say too, I feel like there's a difference between um, playing bluegrass and and you know picking and singing and in, in your local community, and then going on the road with a bluegrass band. And Patty brought up a good point about, you know, when you're traveling the country or even just the state and you're staying in hotel rooms and you're smacked in a van or a bus and it, it gets kind of intense and <laughs> um, it, it's not necessarily fun. 
you know, traveling down the road, it's fun playing and meeting people, but the actual travel part is hard and kind of dirty and you're stuck with guys and girls and the level of fifth grade humor that came out on the kick and grass <laughs> bus. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's pretty bad. So um, you have to put up with a lot if you, if you're going to tour with, you know, people that are not part of your family, um, they become a second family. And that takes a high level of, you know, what Nancy was saying about the band members, families who, who were okay with a girl being on the bus, that's real. That's, you know, people taking, taking a, a higher level approach to um, this being a career for people and respecting the job that it is. Um, that it's a job. It's not just traveling around, having fun. Um, and so that's something that I think we're, we're getting to a point where that's now accepted and, and okay. Um, yeah. Could I, could I throw in something here? Is it, is it, um, yeah, please. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm late. So I don't know what the protocol is. Uh, if, if you, if you're just having, um, please jump in Missy. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Please. I'm sorry, I couldn't be here earlier, um, but I, I just wanted to make a, um, a nod to, to what Nancy said about um, um, in the encouragement aspect of it from the women's part, but also I think it's really important to acknowledge the men who made this happen. And like Larry Stevenson, who hired Kristen because mm -hmm. she was the best person for the job. And, and, I, and I think that it's important to acknowledge that when it happens. I also, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a slippery slope when you talk about the ones who have actually been involved with diminishing our roles, and who have stopped the gigs and who have said no women on the buses and who have said you can't be in my band because you're not related to me. All of these things I'm saying because I've heard them all said to me and um, by particular men who everyone would know. Um, I'm not saying it's not necessarily like, I'm not trying to like out a bunch of people, but at the same time, I think that we've come to a point, Many much of that happened many years ago, but we have come to a point that I think that it's important to find a constructive way to deal with people when we, when we do, um, meet with uh you know uh, um obstruction and 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 some sort of a healthy way of saying you know i'm not you know i'm not talking about demonizing or or attacking i'm not talking that at all but just some sort of of a healthy way of of bringing it out into to a, a safe environment and saying you know this is what i'm experiencing and or trying to deal with the person because that is one way to um, sort of unearth it and, um, you know, put it in the light. Um, but it's also really important, I think, to, like I said, to acknowledge all those people who are doing like really cool things and who have been doing for years and years, um, you know, uh, and I, I've, I've experienced both kinds. And also, like, I took to Linda's uh thought you know about being on the road and and being in a van it's another world and um and it is a it's a it's a family sorry uh stripy girls making an appearance here um it's another family but i i can tell you you know from my experience it, it's all about the people it, I've, I've been on the road with both men and women and, and it's just about the people who, that make it like there, you know, it can be, it can be really fun with all women. It can be, or it can not be really fun with all women. And it's just because it just depends on the people. Um, but, um, I've experienced, uh, so anyway, just want to throw that in. I'll step back out. Thank you so much for jumping in. We appreciate it. And we're so glad that you're here with us tonight. Um, and yeah, I guess to that end too, you know, we've talked a little bit about encouragement and about making sure that people are making room for women to have those spaces, whether it's in bands or at jams, but what are some other things that we can do to help mentor women 
coming up in bluegrass and what are some things that you all wish you had either known coming up or experiences you wish you'd had coming up or something someone you wish someone had told you or maybe something that someone did tell you that you're really glad that they told you when they did. Well, I will say just real quickly to that very point um, that the things that I wish people had told me as a, as a young woman um, were when I would join certain bands and, and the, the band members were notorious for something, um, but nobody said anything. And so I think that part of that was because the community was um, uh, smaller then. And part of it is because our social media aspect didn't exist then. Um, but I think that what you guys are doing, you know, what Handsome Ladies is doing, any, any sort of community that we create where people are talking about the tough subjects and saying, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't a great choice for you to join these folks because, you know, this is something that we know, or maybe it's a great environment for you to it just, it's just about talking. So I think um, the fact that we're still talking uh, that was brought up earlier. Yeah, I know it's been forever my whole life. And, um, but it's okay. Cause we're, it, you know, it's, we still have work to do, but I think the com creating the community that things like handsome ladies creates, creates a sense of, of a safe net, a safe place for people to talk about things. And the most things that I wish people had told me was not to join such and such band because I was going to be with a bunch of people, you know, somebody that I really didn't want to be around. And it was like known throughout. And I was so young, I didn't under I didn't know that. So I think keeping that communication is really important. Um, yeah, I think that well, I am very grateful for all of the um, camps and training through like Pinecone and Jam. I definitely wish that I had had handsome ladies when I was first starting. Um, because other than my sister and a few like um, various mentors, I wouldn't be around that many females in this type of music. I would like hear of people and listen to them. But I think definitely something that I wish I had heard um, would be more discussions like these and having like female musicians come in and talk about the realities of touring and how you can prepare or even if you can prepare for something like that. Um, so I think just increasing educational opportunities for not only the women who want to be in this type of music, but also to the greater public so we can continue to educate and implement changes. Thank you, Jesse. Anybody else want to jump in with something you wish you had been told or known starting out or words of wisdom you want to pass on because we've got some young folks here in the room too. I think what Missy said about not being told something very obvious, like I feel like I was in those situations a few times, it's like why wouldn't you tell me that? <laughs> and having, uh, you know, I watched the IBMA women um, panel as well and Missy, you, always, you also said something about having a seat for everyone at the table and I think everyone not having their voice um, as a person, but also musically is really important. Um, we have jams in my studio once a month. <laughs> we will get back to that. And I look around and see all these young musicians playing together and eating together and talking together and jamming together. And I think, and talking while we're eating, but playing music and hearing, you know, having a voice, promoting acceptance, like being, you know, having everyone being included and making sure that everyone has a time to speak and have a voice is really important. I would say take care of yourself. I wish somebody had told me to take better care of myself on the road when I was younger, because it's hard. Like, it's just, it's just really hard. It wears you down. <laughs> so, you know, staying healthy on the road, taking care of yourself. And one of the best advice um, I got in college 
was creating your own opportunities. And I didn't know what I, that meant when I was so young. And it seems really obvious, but it, you know, it was a mentor of mine still to this day. He said, you have to create your own opportunities. And that only becomes truer as I get older. I think too, to the importance of organizations like the Handsome Ladies or anyone who is approaching music from an inclusive perspective is this um, having a voice at the table, but also knowing um, that the people around you are supporting you and that they're there to help you break the code and figure it out. Um, I, I was lucky, Leslie, like you, your husband helped you break the code and get in like that. I, I have a husband who very much the same helped me figure out what are these people talking about and <laughs> how are they doing this? And um, if you grew up in it, Nancy, you, you had people doing that from a young age. Um, and then as a, but as an older person coming into it, I didn't, there were a lot of things I didn't know what I didn't even know until I found I didn't know them, if that's a thing. Um, and the Handsome Ladies to me is a group that wants to share the, the collective knowledge that has been gained and the, the hard learned lessons that were just like, let me tell you whatever I can to support and finding people, it doesn't matter if they're men or women, people who have that approach in life of um, wanting to encourage and share and support is so important. And so organizations that intend to do that and form around that, I think are so important in, in bluegrass because it's about keeping the music alive by supporting people to learn how to do it, um, not because it's an ex exclusive club, but because it's something that's amazing and fun and joyful to do. Um, so I think that's why it's important to have groups like the Handsome Ladies around. This is a hard one for me because I have about 50 sentences here that I've typed out. So if anybody wants my list, uh, contact me offline, but um, I'll quote Dolly Parton, stay ready. You know, when someone asks you to sing a song, know what song it's going to be in what key and know all the words and do it. <laughs> uh, Girl Scouts of the USA, be prepared. Um, Patty mentioned uh, creating your own opportunities. I, I wrote something similar, you know, be proactive more than you are reactive. Um, take charge of things that you want to do. Don't just, you know, I think a lot of women are kind of naturally submissive or just take a back seat and and you have to learn not to do that. I was painfully shy when I was a kid and never when I was on stage, but anywhere else I was. But, um, you know, we just have to, to learn to do that, you know, to take care of ourselves. Um, something I learned from Fred Bartenstein just recently is that it's more important to do something, to see something happen that needs to happen than it is to take credit for it. Um, Gosh, there's so many things. You know, look for good role models, uh, good for, uh, put people together. Uh, my, my daughter went to college and got a, a music business degree and her, and we were living in Nashville at the time. And so her friends were always telling me, well, I want to do this. You know, this is a, the career that I want to go into. And I'd say, well, I know somebody who does that. And so I would set up lunch for them and they would, and they would sit down and talk and, you know, what degree did you get? Or what did you do that prepared you to do the job that you're doing now? And and I just think we could do a lot more of that, you know, helping young people, helping each other. And um, it's, um, you know, I think it's important to know your own strengths and weaknesses, both so that, that you can compensate for your weaknesses and you can make sure you have people on your team working with you who do things that you're not that good at. But on the other hand, it's always important to just keep learning and educating yourself and be willing to do things in, in different ways and, and take advantage of opportunities. But um, Anyway, I could go on and on. <laughs> there are lots of things. I guess it, it comes of being the oldest person on this panel, I think. <laughs> I have a long list. And actually, I know we had somebody else. Um, Vivian, I think you had mentioned that you had a question kind of along this vein as well. Do you want to unmute or add it to the chat or we already covered it? It's been covered to some degree. Um, it could be delved in more, but um, it's negative, and I don't want to put 
a super negative spin on all of this. So it's probably good that I not delve into it. <laughs> but it can be really hard in a bluegrass jam, especially when you're um, not only just learning the instrument, but you've never jammed before, you know. Um, especially when you're the only woman, it can be really hard. Yeah. So that's one reason I'm, I'm very happy to be with handsome ladies because it is very, very supportive. And I, I thank Vicki and Lee for all that they do to keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, certainly one of the ways that the music keeps going, and thank you, Vivian, for jumping in. I appreciate it. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, but, you know, certainly one way that we keep this going is by bringing more people in of all different ages and levels. And I know one topic that is very big right now, you know, Linda mentioned inclusion. There's, you know, how do we bring more young people in and mentor them? But also, how do we make sure that we are being welcoming and inclusive, not just to women, right? But so many of us have so many identities, parents or people of color or, you know, all those different intersecting labels. Um, so if anyone wants to jump in on any piece of that, you know, how do we get more young people involved in music, whether it's, you know, bringing them to handsome ladies jams or handsome ladies youth chapters um, or, you know, if anyone wants to chime in, I know Leslie, you and I talked a little bit about, you know, not only being a woman, but being a woman with more melanin in the skin and whether that has ever been something that you've encountered specific issues or barriers around too. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I am mixed um, with a lot of different things. And, you know, I get that question a lot. Most every show, someone comes up after and says, you know, what are you mixed with? And that doesn't offend me at all. Um, but um, Jamie and I were talking about, um, one thing I was very scared to go into bluegrass, to be honest, um, with, you know, I was like, Dewey, you know, what are people gonna think? And, cause I've always worried about what people think, but I've learned and I'll tell all you young people um, of course, I still hope that everybody considers me a young person. I think I'll consider myself young until I'm 100. <laughs> but um, it doesn't matter. And everybody, you know, when people ask me that, I tell them I'm mixed with God's love because we're all children of God. And, you know, that um, I have had some issues. Um, I've had some really nasty people on Facebook say bad things about me. Um, that I felt the need to respond to that, you know, but I pray for those people because, you know, um, culture is a big issue today, um, as we all know, but it doesn't define me, you know, my heart and who I am inside and the music, you know, I hope people listen to me because they enjoy my music and enjoy what I have to share. So, um, you know, and that's definitely, um, I don't know, it, it has been a barrier at some points, but for the most part, everybody's been super inclusive. Um, but, you know, I tend to find um, in the elderly community, especially even the area I'm from, that's, you know, um, there are things that are hard to change about folks, but, you know, I always just take it with the approach that, you know, like I said, it doesn't define me, it doesn't really matter that I'm darker. Um, and that I'm mixed with all these different things, you know, um, I just am me and, you know, I hope you like me for me, and, you know, so, um, so that, that's what I would say to that. But I want to tell all the young people, it doesn't matter what color or what gender or anything of what you are. If you, and, and everybody is important in this industry, not just people on the stage, the people who do the lights, the promoters, you know, they're the fans. You know, if it weren't for friends and fans and and all these people that make this whole thing go, then it there wouldn't be. We wouldn't get to do what we love, um, you know, if there weren't people to listen to us and 
um, there's so whatever you want to do, if you want to play an instrument and sing and songwriter, or you want to do the lights, or you want to just come to a show, you know, I'm sure there's others, and you know, everybody's important, and it doesn't matter, you know, what your background or what your what, what the color of your skin is. I think being taught that in an early age is really important. I think kids and music belong together. I am so passionate about teaching kids how to play music. I mean, it's just incredible. And they're, they're very honest. Kids are very honest. Um, they're very, they can be very open. And to see at least the local community here, the kids playing music together, just, it makes, it fills my heart so much. So um, I think especially the next generation of kids, I feel like they're growing up in a different way. I feel like all of this is evolving, but I, like I do, I think we, we need to, to use our own voices when it comes to, to skin color or religion or any of these things, because in just like bluegrass, I mean, we're all different levels. We're jamming. We're all different levels. We're all different backgrounds and we're coming together to, to produce this amazing type of music. And like Linda said, Earlier, I love the word joyful, you know, joyful and um, it should make you feel a certain way. And that shouldn't have barriers on it, on any of these type of barriers. I started studying a foreign language when I was nine years old. And I've always been, I've always thought differences made people more interesting. And, uh, and that's why I was raised and that's why I raised my daughter. And differences make us stronger. You know, if, if everybody was the same, it would just see, be so boring and and uh, bland and gray, you know. So I, I think it's just a, a perspective that has to be taught and, and led by example. And I think you're gorgeous, Leslie. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. We've got a panel of smart, talented, gorgeous women here. Um, so one question that's come up in the chat um, that kind of follows on with some of this too, and hopefully expands on some of it, is how have you seen the increased involvement of women in bluegrass affect the genre as a whole? Oh, it's made it better. I was thinking today about the O oh Brother phenomenon and Alison Krauss and the O oh Sister album. And I didn't start playing bluegrass until 2002, 2003. So I, like Jesse was saying, she entered the scene with people like Sierra Hall and Molly Tuttle and all playing. Um, I entered the scene with Alison Krauss already out there. And I'm curious, you know, Nancy and maybe Missy before that, it was probably different. Um, but I feel like the, so many doors were already open for me when I started playing the music. And I know that it was not that way before that. So I don't know that I can speak to that as, as much as people prior to the early 2000s. I think role models are so important. I think a lot of young girls play fiddle because of Alex and Krauss. Rhonda Vincent has caused a lot of girls to want to play mandolin. Missy Rains has caused a lot of girls to get serious about playing the bass. Um, there, you know, Lynn Morris uh, opened the door for banjo players, Lori Lewis, you know, there's so many uh, good musicians. You just have to look around for them. But uh, you're, you're right, it is important. And, and it's, it's interesting that when it was difficult for women to be side men and, and predominantly male bands, they just started their own bands and, and there's nothing you know, there's no better revenge than success. You know, Alison Krauss is the most wealthy bluegrass music in the history of the world. She's a woman, you know, she's a band leader. Um, so I just do what you do and do it well and be successful. God bless you, you know. I I know I grew up in a band where we sang in girl keys because my sister and I sang all the leads, you know, so we sang a lot of songs in G and D and C and and, you know, it was a shock to me to discover that Lynn Morris made all of her band members play an F sharp or something like that, just because that was a key she wanted to, to play and, you know, that was good for her voice. And I'm getting off the track. <laughs> no, I think. Ask right. another question. You're what, right. Missy? I think you're right on, Nancy. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I think, I think the, the biggest thing 
the voice of the music has changed because of women's inclusion, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. Um, it, we've got now we have more um, uh, equal opportunity murder songs. And um, <laughs> so, you know, like th that voice of an of, you know, the woman uh, taking uh, being um, uh, the aggressor, the, the achiever, whatever mm -hmm. is now being heard. And, you know, when I was growing up there, there were women doing that who had written great stuff and who had voices like Ola Bell Reed and, mm -hmm. and Glory Bell and, um, you know, Lori Lewis and, and, um, and Lynn Morris and, and Katie Lauer from Cincinnati and people like mm -hmm. that there, it was there, but there, obviously not nearly what there is today. So, um, but I experienced the same thing even for me when I, st I played bass for um, uh, uh, Claire Lynch for years and Claire sang her version of bluegrass in um, E flats and B flats and all sorts of different keys. But, but I, I mean, the music can't help but have changed because of the voice of of the woman and the women who are writing songs from a woman's mm -hmm. perspective uh, one of the things that i found really hard for for me as when i was younger and um i as instrumentally i was very, it didn't matter because you know there's you just like I was excited and, and influenced by Tony Rice and Sam Bush and, and David Grisman and, and then of course all the early guys too. But, um, but when it came to singing, I had to look really hard to find that inspiration um, and, and not so much the, the voice, but the words to the songs. And, and so that's changed because now we have a you know, whole slew, slew of women writers who are, who are writing songs that I can relate to. Great, thank you. And that actually segues very nicely into a couple other questions. Um, one that came in was, how do you handle male-oriented lyrics? Do you change to female or just go with it? And then the other question that somebody sent in was, can you talk about being a woman and what you like about singing lead and harmony with other women, with men? What are some of the differences? Um, I, I love changing lyrics to traditional bluegrass songs, <laughs> but that might be because I'm a songwriter. I love writing my own songs for exactly the reason that Missy said uh, sometimes I just have to write them for myself because they didn't exist before. Um, but I also like to re change it up so that it sounds like something that I connect with. I mean, I think it's hard to sing a song from a perspective that you don't understand. And to truly convey the artistic feeling behind it, you have to feel that feeling. And so sometimes I'll just change one word or two words or a whole line because I'm the person singing it. And nine times out of 10, people don't even notice. They just are doing their thing and listening along and they don't know that you changed a word or two words. And, um, but I, I, I'm a big fan of changing it to come from my voice if I'm the one singing it, um, change it to a girl and make her the, the person that you're singing from her perspective. But also, um, when it comes to singing harmony, I love to sing harmony. I would love nothing more than to just sing harmony all day long. Um, and it's really been fascinating for me singing in the Kick and Grass Band um, when I was singing higher than the men, but they thought I was singing lower because I was down in my register. It, it got really difficult to find those three, those traditional bluegrass three-part harmonies with a girl and two guys. Um, I was so thankful when Patty was in the band and we could really hit those close female harmonies and get a, a baritone underneath us. It was um, a lot of fun because that for me is so much fun, but sometimes it's really hard because of that high lonesome sound and the tone of the register of women versus men to find that sweet spot for those three part harmonies in bluegrass. So it really just depends on the people you're singing with and what they can hear and how the voices meld or don't meld. And 
it's not all that different than how personalities just either meld or they don't meld. Um, so you can find that in harmony singing too. Um, Linda, I, it reminds me of Cold Rain and Snow. We changed the lyrics to the, the, the female actually killing the man and <laughs> her album. And I think, and I read a, I actually read a um, sort of a precursor to that song too in Hank Patting the Current and Gonna Be Treated This Way is about the morning of, by the way. So I have three rules to the lyrics. It's either um, change, keep, or hard pass. So I either change them, I keep them, or I give them a hard pass. I remember, um, I love that Dirk Powell album where he does Say Darling Stay. And there's that verse, um, say little darling, if you were mine, you wouldn't do nothing but starch and iron. Say darling, say. Starch and iron will be your trade. I'd get drunk and lay in the shade. Say darling, say. That's a hard pass for me. I'm not going to sing that verse. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> And to that end too, are there any songs that you just don't sing because of the lyrics or because of the history or, you know, are there any songs that are just hard pass? Or is that just a hard pass on that question? No, actually, I think it's a really important question because there's a there's a like a whole movement, right? A movement. I don't know what I'm saying, but there's like a like there's definitely been a lot of energy in the last year or a couple of years about people choosing not to sing like the old the, the murder songs um, that were um, oriented the man killing the woman. Um, songs and th that are that are you know rooted in deep tradition and there's there's a whole you know sort of thing out there about people sort of saying enough is enough like I'm not singing this song anymore and um, so I think it's an important subject I'm not voicing an opinion one way or the other on it I'm just saying that I think that it's actually a really important thing to discuss During, I really appreciate the Pinecone Youth Camps. We do that in the mornings with the instructors. You know, we talk about the background of tunes and not only the, the singer-songwriter tunes with lyrics, but we talk about the instrumentals. We talk about the titles. We talk about where they came from. And I really appreciate that about, about those camps because we do dive into the history a bit. And I think, you know, not from that, um, that fundamental place but there are songs that are just hard to pull off like I love the song pig at a pen I, I actually love that song I just think it's so much fun but if I try and sing it it sounds ridiculous like I've got a pig home in a pen cord to feed him on all I need is a pretty little girl to feed him when I'm gone I can't change that song <laughs> that's the song that's it <laughs> but it it's not something that I can pull off it's just I don't have a pretty little girl at home feeding my pigs and it, I don't know. There's just songs like that where I'm like, I can't sing that. You could sing harmony to it. Yeah. I think it's important to know that you have the choice, you know, sing songs you're comfortable singing or not. Mm -hmm. um, um, I, I knew someone, an older gentleman, a fiddle player um, who was old when I was a teenager who had an uncle that would leave the room when marching through Georgia was played. He, you know, he was, he didn't care for that song. He was on a, a different side of the, of the Civil War. Um, I used to play in a band that I would leave the stage and go use the bathroom when they did Up Against the Wall, You Redneck Mother, because I just thought it was a really stupid song. <laughs> so, but, um, and I, you know, I've listened to Banks of the Ohio and Pretty Polly, but I, I don't really want to sing them. Um, I don't know. I just think it's important to know that you, you can choose, you know, you can write your own songs, you can sing the songs you want to. Um, and I've done it both ways. I've, I've changed the words or I've not changed the words. But I'm like, Linda, I really like to sing harmony. So I'm usually following whatever the lead singer is doing. I think that um, when I was in a band with my sister, we wouldn't choose a lot of songs that, um, I mean, at least for me, some of the songs, some of the, um, like male guitarists that I look up to like Tony Rice or Doc Watson sometimes I just wouldn't sing their vocal songs because I was much more comfortable singing like an Alison Krauss or an original song 
Um, and then like, it's also funny to see how in my bluegrass ensemble at Belmont, um, it's only female singers, which is very different than um, some of the bands I've played with where I've been the only girl and it's like three female instrumentalists and then three to four female vocalists and how sometimes guys will suggest songs like Freeborn Man and they'll be like, no. And it's, it's just, it's definitely interesting to see more of, um, more of a female perspective in songs and how um, bands are changing. Well, I uh, have a little different answer to this. I like to um, get into character and pretend that I'm that person and, and like act it out. <laughs> if it's like a male driven song or it's about a male, like, because we're women, we can do everything. So <laughs> I like to just get into that character and really like dive into what that um, person who wrote the song or, you know, the lyrics, like what they're feeling and thinking and see if that connects to me. And if it does, then, you know, I can sing it and not change the words, but, um, but I think it's okay to change the words. Like uh, Nancy said, you have a choice, you can do whatever you want. And um, for me, I just usually go along with the flow and then I'll just play a game in my head about, you know, whatever it may be and try to, to, you know, reenact it and really like identify with it like pig in a pen I've got a pig and you know I'm you know whatever like I just try to identify with it that that's that's what I do somebody in the chat Leslie says they're going to write a song about your earrings because they are so spectacular thank you I appreciate that I like uh, sparkly bling and I was so excited tonight to be able to put some on <laughs> they've been sheltered for too long with all this going on so i had to bring them out but thank you very much for the compliment <laughs> we've got about 10 minutes left there was one more question that is actually not necessarily related male female at all but it's just the what is the feeling in the industry about how it recovers post covid do we feel that there is pent-up demand for live music and i will also add to that question which i think is great um, but what changes do you think will stay with us after live music comes back? Y'all, everybody's ready. We're ready to hear live music right now. We're, it's, it's pin up. People are, they're ready. I think we are going to, um, to have an art explosion when all of this is over. I think, um, I see a lot of artists releasing singles and everybody's on the internet right now. Good Lord. You can see a live, you can see live stream pretty much any hour of the day you want to. Um, also one thing that has really struck me is that you have so much access to pretty much anyone right now. I mean, there's so many people giving workshops and I'm taking fiddle lessons y'all right now. It's awesome. So, you know, I, it's been really wonderful. I, you know, having a small child at home and you're just tired all the time. <laughs> Um, my husband said, I said, Hey, this artist, um, is offering this master class. I really want to see, but I don't know, you know, I got a lot going on. I, I need, probably need to sleep when I need to, when I can. And he looked at me, he said, why would you not take advantage of all the opportunities that COVID has to offer? And I said, you know, you're right about that. So you see all these opportunities right now. And as far as things staying, I do think that the industry has definitely evolved in a way that maybe no one could predict. I think there will be some things that do stay. I think I'm most afraid of, of um, people have, have, have really um, sort of t taken a, a hard look at, at how this has affected musicians in particular, artists in particular, and it's had a devastating effect on, on, on the, cre pe the content creators. Um, and people have been very uh, empathetic about that. My greatest fear is that, that that will change when we come back um, because, and, and what, by what I mean is like that, that, that they'll, that, that we, 
that they'll stop placing value on what it is that we're doing, that artists are doing again. And, and I say that not to be like with a chip on my shoulder, but you know, it's to make a living wage as an, as an artist up to this point, up to the pandemic, is really 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 hard and it's mostly because um the perception of what art is worth to people has is varies greatly and it has not been up where it needs to be and so but everybody realizes now how much like oh yeah i need that in my life and and i can't live without live music so everybody's making it happen but my greatest fear is that you know, three years from now, things, people will still be making the same kind of money because, you know, to, to do, to do what we, to, as artists. And, um, I think that I'm not saying it can change right away, but I just hope that people, you know, can take with them this idea of, um, how important art is to our culture. I think to Missy's point that there might be a few people out there who maybe didn't value music before and so they don't miss it. But to the flip side of that, there are so many people out there who truly did value music and are starving for it. And I think, you know, I have friends who don't play their own music and they have no way to get it right now. Um, I, I feel very lucky that I can I'm not just a consumer of music I create in my house with my family. I can just pick up a guitar and make music happen. I don't think that everyone in America is in that same boat. And there are a lot of people who are missing a fundamental element of what it means to be human right now because they're only listening to music through devices. Um, and that, that we, there's a craving for human connection and music provides that. And so I think it's going to come back differently. I think having big shows and big spaces is going to be a slow comeback, but smaller intimate connection music experiences are going to be just something that people are, are actually craving. And so there might be a way that we as um, the Roots music community can tap into that that's a little bit easier to access um, like jams and house concerts and backyard things um, and being a little bit creative in how we reach people in a way that they're, everybody's comfortable with. Um, because I think there's a, there's a craving for it that people are feeling um, and they can't wait until it's safe to experience live music again. I, um... I agree with everything that's been said. In a way, like, I think that people will love to go to concerts again. Um, but I think that streaming has become kind of a new normal in our society in some ways, like, in different industries, like the movie industry. I'm not convinced that movie theaters are gonna come back because people are comfortable just streaming movies in their house. But um, I definitely hope that um, concert, I think concerts will come back, but I'm definitely worried about festivals and like big, um, big concerts. And I think it'll be a while before those come back. Um, but I'm hopeful since there are still small shows going on in Nashville that it'll come back. I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen or how long it's going to take. Uh, you know, I think what Jesse just said about people wanting to feel safe is very important from the performers uh, side, as well as the people in the audience. And, and that's just really tough right now. I know I'm going to be more supportive of bands that come through my area because in the past year, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of music and, and if I've heard a band 20 times, then, then I think, well, I don't need to go see them. I've heard them a lot. I know what, you know, but I would now just because I want to support them <laughs> because I, I miss it, you know, and I, and I haven't been able to do that. So I think I'm going to be more supportive of live music. 
than I have been before of, you know, just people coming through the area, that sort of thing. Yeah. Adding on to what Jesse said earlier, um, I think that after like this COVID thing's over, it's going to take a while for people to get used to uh, going back to live concert and stuff since we've been in COVID and quarantine for so long. Mm -hmm. So I think that after a while, they will come back flooding in as well. Um, but it'll take a, some time because people are getting so used to staying at home and being able to just stream everything from home, like Jesse said earlier. But also, like, there's different resources as well, like YouTube or stuff. And also, um, like, close friends and family, you could also have little concerts for them as well. So, like, it's kind of like opportunities uh, during COVID, given a lot of opportunities during COVID. But then after COVID as well, there'd be a lot more opportunities. But taking advantage of the opportunities we have now is kind of cool because later, like, we can look back and say, while we were in quarantine, we had this opportunity. And I mean, we still have a whole bunch of things we could do. And since uh, my generation, which is, um, since Nakata and I are very young, we still haven't had a lot of things to do. But COVID-19 has given us a lot of things to do as well as taking away a lot of things. So being positive really helped. And I really appreciate the, the artists who've tried hard to stay in touch, you know. I mean, I know the Kruger brothers a lot better than I used to because they, they've just been online so much. And I, you know, I feel very at home at Bela Flex basement now, you know, because <laughs> those concerts he and Abby have done, um, you know, so my hat's off to the, to the songwriters and the musicians and the people who are still trying to reach out to their fans. I know it's been difficult. And I want to say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry because it's irreplaceable it really is it's irreplaceable i'm not i'm not worried about that portion of it we will be back in due time and i want to tell everybody not to forget about the venues too because um that's the one thing that i'm concerned with um as a venue owner there have been fellow many fellow venue owners that could not survive this um, we were very blessed that we were able to as of now. Um, hopefully we will continue to be able to, but, you know, it's um, done a number on us financially. Um, and there's a lot of other venues that have just, you know, shut down festivals that are closed. So um, just as much as the artists and the performers, you know, that we need to be out there playing music, the venues and festivals and the promoters also need to be able, you know, we need a place to do that. So I just, you know, want to encourage everybody not to forget to support your local venue if you're able to, because um, we're really struggling. There's not really been much specific help for venues out there. Leslie, can we talk about how to do that now? Can we talk about how to support the industry itself as of right now? Um, well, I mean, you know, um, donations, even kind words, um, because I'll be honest, every day, um, you know, I hear I have thousands of patrons that come in and out of our doors. And um, there are a lot of people that are really upset that we aren't having the shows. There are a lot of people that are upset that we've rescheduled the show. There's a lot of people upset. You know, you can't please everybody. But there are days that I literally come home and I'm I'm just ready to cry and have cried many times because of ugly things that people say. So sometimes just like sending an email to say, Hey, we, we appreciate you. I remember playing there a couple of years ago and just wanted to check on you and say hi and that you guys are awesome. And, you know, I've gotten some emails like that myself and got one today um, from a really big country artist to say, Hey, I, I miss, please don't, please don't shut down. I want to come back there. That meant so much to me because we hear, a lot of bad stuff, you know, people that are upset about not getting a refund or whatever, and just struggling to keep the business alive. And you're not making any money because you're rescheduling everything. So donate if you can, you know, most venues um, and festivals have a donate option. If you're, you're able to, you're blessed enough to do that, do that. I mean, I've personally donated to other festivals and venues. Cause I mean, that's really important to um, the entertainment industry, you know, the venues and the festivals and promoters and all that. So those are the ways that I would, that, that I would say to 
you know, and go on social media, get, you know, like them, give them a thumbs up, give them a positive review or comment or something like that. Those things help a ton. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. We are a couple minutes over time. I want to be respectful of everyone's time. If you have to leave, please, you know, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. For anyone who does want to spend a couple extra minutes, if you have other questions or just want to hang out, um, I'm happy to hang out for a few more minutes. Um, I will also plug Marianne Kovach put something in the chat about um, uh, the February 26th conversation. There will be an online conference hosted by the Blue Ridge Music Center. Uh, the website will be updated in a couple of days, blueridgemusiccenter.org, um, but the details for a place in the band. So there will be more conversation like this. Um, also put in a plug, there is an organization in North Carolina called Arts North Carolina um, that has been working the um, legislative end of support for artists and venues and the Arts Council. Uh, Arts Day is coming up in late March, March 22nd through 24th. Um, a lot of their work and advocacy has helped get state funds to help support local, uh, North Carolina arts nonprofit organizations. Also the Save Our Stages Act, which is so crucial to so many of the venues right now to what Leslie was talking about. Um, so, and that is you know, that is open to anyone who wants to participate in Arts Day, who wants to learn more about advocacy, particularly statewide at the state level for North Carolina, but they also do some local work as well. Um, so thanks everyone for coming this evening and we hope we'll see you again soon. And thanks again to the handsome ladies for inviting Pinecone to put this on and thanks to all our panelists. I think we can actually all unmute and applaud and I think we'll be okay for a minute. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Hey, this is great. Bye. Wonderful. Loved it. Thank y'all so much. Thanks, everybody. Good job. Good job. Wonderful.